Uh, originally, I submitted a full paper for this uh, for my presentation, so that I do not need to go into the details too much. But it has not been distributed, and therefore I probably have to be more detailed. I'm talking about a more general issue. This is the issue of political corruption in China. Corruption is not per se a kind of a judicial category, but it's more a kind of a social category. And I would like to trace the issue why China, despite a high level of corruption, has developed so rapidly. The uh, Transparency International uh, Index in 2016 ranked China on the place 79th among 176 countries. And for certain, China has a high level of corruption. According to Chinese sources, until uh, June 2017, and between 2012 and 2017, 1.4 million party officials have been punished, persecuted, and punished due to corruption. According to the Chinese Communist Party, corruption is the biggest challenge of its power. And according to Chinese uh, opinion polls, corruption is the number one uh, po social problem which is uh, co in the concern of the people. I have eight points which I will address in my presentation. The first issue is what is the meaning of corruption in general and in terms of uh, China? What are the causes of corruption in processes of development and in China? Which types do we find in China? Are there or whether there are cultural particularities? Then I come to my core thesis about developmental corruption. Then the next point is the fighting corruption, the ongoing anti-corruption drive in China and its uh, outcome. And finally, a brief summary and conclusion. Uh, with regards to the meaning or the definition of corruption, I uh, address the definition by Colin Nye, behavior, it's a behavior devi deviating from formal duties of a public role because of private regarding wealth or status gains. In China, we find a somewhat different definition. The Chinese term for corruption is a combination of two terms, tanwu and uh, fubai. Tanwu is more related to the Western concept of corruption, meaning that it's an abuse of public position to line one's own pockets and is strongly related to issue as uh, bribing, active and passive bribing of uh, embezzlement, of squandering public uh, money, of the purchase, sale and purchase of offices and vote buying and other uh, uh, phenomena. Fubai is more a traditional category in China because it's traditionally related to the negative behavior of an actor or an organization. It's more a category of moral decay, of moral degeneration, and everything which does not confirm to the ethical standards of a current uh, leadership. Uh, it's classified as a publicly un unacceptable misbehavior committed by state functionaries for private gains at the expense of public interests and or causing damage to public interests and values. And this value issue, this ethical issue, is a very crucial point of uh, what is called fubai or the moral decay of society. The causes of corruption in processes of modernization, and China is still in the process of modernization, is a lack of political institutions. And one crucial point is a lack of checks and balances, or independent checks and balances. We have also a value change, and the people are frequently uh, not able to discern between traditional values and more modern or current values. And this leads to a kind of a puzzle which values are valid and which are not. We have a lack of distinction between public and private interests and the emerging of new social groups such as private entrepreneurs who want to be accepted socially and politically and therefore try to use some kind of a bribery to buy social status. We have the monopoly of power of the Chinese Communist Party and the lack of effective and, uh, checks and balances. 
And finally, a, a crucial issue is the transition from the planned economy to a market economy. This marked, tradition, this marked transition has enhanced the opportunity of officials uh, to gain uh, money or, or other social issues uh, for themselves. In the literature, we find frequently uh, a description of the destructive consequences of corruption. For instance, that it would be detrimental to economic growth, uh, that it is generating general distrust, that public uh, resources are squandered, uh, that it leads to political instability, to growing income disparities and therefore inequality, and that it's finally eroding the legitimacy of the political elite, or in China, the Communist Party. But the question, of course, arises, why has China developed so rapidly, uh, of, of, although it has a high level of corruption? If we go into the literature on corruption, we find a differentiation between different types of corruption. For instance, between growth enhancing and growth reducing <coughs> corruption between endemic corruption, which means the abuse of public office, the planned corruption as a political strategy to buy the consent or the loyalty among elites, and uh, developmental corruption, that means that corruption has a positive effect for development processes. Heidenheimer has discerned between the black corruption, meaning that corruption is viewed as harmful by, on the one side, the elites, on the other side, the ordinary people, a white corruption, that corruption is accepted as a beneficial uh, point to uh, societal development, the same by the elite and by the ordinary people, and what he calls a gray corruption, that there is a different perception of corruption by the elites and by the ordinary people. And finally, the differentiation between developmental corruption and predatory or degenerative corruption. That means corruption is not a homogeneous a term or concept, but more a heterogeneous one. And we have to classify always which, kind of or which kinds of corruption do we find in a given uh, country or society. The other question which is uh, heavily discussed is the issue whether or not corruption is related to kind of uh, cultural patterns. In China, we have this uh, concept of guanzi, which is be translated as social connections or social relations. And it is argued that this kind of guanzi, which is like a web uh, over the entire society, provides the infrastructure for corruption. We have secondly the point that uh, the many people, for them, private entrepreneurs, have invested in these social relations and are not, therefore not interested in uh, developing a legal system. Therefore, we have a contradiction between, on the one side, these investments into corruption, and the other side, uh, the uh, fostering of a legal system. And finally, and this is quite interesting, some years ago, two experts of the World Bank compared corruption in the southern part of Africa and in East Asia. And they particularly asked entrepreneurs from Europe where they would like to invest, or where they would prefer to invest, and or, or where not. And uh, the entrepreneurs argued that in Africa, corruption or bribery is more a kind of a, a variable costs because the bureaucracies are frequently changing. And if you have bribed somebody, an official, for instance, uh, then he will demand further payment before he's going to implement what he has promised. And in East Asia, this would be different, because the bureaucracies are rather stable. And if you have bribed somebody, there is a kind of trust uh, engendered. And therefore, this, per this person will, under any circumstances, fulfill what he has promised. And therefore, the World Bank experts, they concluded that in the entrepreneurs want to invest rather in East Asia than in Africa. I prefer this, for China, this term of developmental corruption. And this term of developmental corruption is very strongly linked to the concept of the developmental state. Therefore, I try briefly to introduce what is meant by a uh, developmental state before I turn to the issue of developmental corruption. 
And this concept of the developmental state also provides a concept for analyzing and understanding the behavior of the Chinese state and therefore this concept of uh, developmental corruption. Developmental, corruption, uh, developmental state, this concept has been developed in the early 1970s by Chalmers Johnson and was uh, at first related to the development of Japan. It is argued that developmental states are purposeful states which have a, where the elites have a strong will to develop and are successful in a effective development. And that there is a consent among the political elite that a structured development under a unified leadership would be uh, necessary in, for in China, for instance, uh, the unified leadership of the Communist Party. On the other side, the, this developmental state is effectively intervening into the economy and we find a strong symbiosis, also an asymmetric symbiosis, between the state or the local state on the one side and economy or entrepreneurship on the other side. These developmental states are relatively autonomous agencies, meaning that they are not representative of any interest group in China, such as the state-owned enterprises, the banks, the local cadres, or the private entrepreneurs, but act in a more autonomous way. And these states are strong, strong states uh, displaying state capacity and have an effective bureaucracy at their disposal. And finally, such a state uh, has legitimacy. So I argue that the Chinese state is such a strong state with state capacity. On the one side, he displays transformational capacity. He's able to develop plans. It's not this kind of plans as we had in the Soviet Union, but more the Japanese kind of long-term plans, which are deciding upon the long-term goals of social and economic development. This state has a regulating uh, steering and control capacity, meaning that he is capable of enforcing its, polity, or its policies from the center right down to the townships and villages. That he has the resources for policy implementation available, for instance, the financial resources and the uh, manpower resources. That he displays a bargaining capacity, that he is able to bargain with different strata or groups within the society, that he has a learning capacity, learning from previous mistakes, and he has an innovative capacity for social and for technical innovations. And finally, it's a state displaying legitim legitimacy. The courses for developmental corruption in China is these kind of uh, market opportunities which emerged with the transition from a planned economy to a market economy and uh, which created new incomes for the officials from the central level right down to the townships and villages, a kind of a selling power to certain, uh, to certain groups such as private entrepreneurs, for instance. On the other side, this top-down planning, which is differing from the Soviet un uh, Union planning, and the monitoring system, which is strictly on an annual basis evaluating the behavior of the officials, whether or not they have fulfilled these development plans or not, uh, is an important point of the Carter's evaluation and is, strict, is strongly related to career advancement of, uh, of local cadres. If they are unable to develop a certain location, then you will be removed or even punished. That means if for a long time, if a local official has successfully developed a location, then uh, the leadership, the, the, the higher authorities turn a blind eye to his uh, behavior. And I argue that this kind of behavior for quite some time has supported the development at the particular at the local level. But if a local official, uh, official's policy implementation is detrimental to the local development, or if social unrest occurs, then such an official will be removed and punished by the higher authorities. I try to bring these arguments in this figure. On the one side, we have three pillars, the existence of a developmental state, with state capacity, and with an effective growth policies. On the other side, we have market opportunities, which are used by officials 
to line money in their own pockets. On the other side, we have a top-down planning and an evaluation system, which is strictly evaluating the behavior, the development behavior of local cadres. And these are the major points of what I call the de developmental corruption. Since 2013, with the establishing of a new Chinese leadership in 2012, uh, we have an anti-corruption drive, the biggest anti-corruption drive probably not only in China but across the world, which is still ongoing and lasting until today, and I think it will still last for a couple of years. And uh, this anti-corruption drive is strongly linked to the enforcement of a new reform and development program which has been promulgated in 2013 by the Chinese leadership. That means a new growth model which moves from quantitative development into qualitative development and finally is uh, strongly curbing the behavior uh, of local cadres. And of course, against this new growth model, there are opposing forces, particularly these who are losing uh, their money, for instance, in some part of their income due to corruption. And these are state-owned enterprises, banks, private entrepreneurs, or even local cadres. So one point, and corruption in China was not always a, uh, a weapon against corruption itself, but more related to uh, removing opposing forces within the uh, bureaucracy. And therefore, this anti-corruption drive is also strongly related to pushing back the influence of interest groups and in bringing cadres and the armed forces under, uh, into line. Of course, one effect was the reducing of corruption currently. It is figuring as a kind of deterrence. If you are corrupt, you will be removed, you will be punished. Uh, and therefore, it's better not to be corrupt. This is the message which the central leadership wants to transmit to the various uh, levels of uh, uh, administration. Eliminating political opponents, regaining central control from the local level, and consolidating the party state are the major aims behind this anti-corruption drive. Of course, it has diminished corruption and currently is still working as a kind of a deterrence instrument. But fighting corruption is, of course, selective. Because I would assume that more than 90% of the officials are corrupt. And if you arrest everybody, the Communist Party will abolish itself. So it's impossible. And therefore, it's selective. If people are opposing the new growth model, the new development model, or if they are unable to develop an area, then they will be removed and punished for corruption because everybody has uh, a kind of a, they have information on everybody on corrupt practices and it's rather easy to use corruption as a stick to remove uh, opposing officials. Uh, the population in China, the ordinary people, uh, the majority supports this anti-corruption drive because it does not impact upon them. And uh, the, this also uh, contributes to the le legitimizing the current party leader, Xi Jinping, who is by many people praised as a strong leader who seems to appear to be able to fight corruption effectively. Officials and entrepreneurs are more careful now, and this is the flip side of this uh, campaign. It has on the one side a negative impact on private entrepreneurs because they are reluctant now to invest into the economy because they have no access to the local officials and cannot collaborate with them in implementing their uh, plans for investments. On the other side, it's reducing the compliance and the commitment of local cadres in terms of policy innovations or technical innovations at the local level. So what is my summary and conclusion? I argue that the existence of an uh, effective developmental state leads to a kind of developmental corruption and uh, for some quite a while, the temporary acceptance of corrupt practices by local cadres if they were capable of developing an area without protests by the local population. Fighting corruption, of course, is, uh, I would argue, only temporarily successful. It does not contain any sustainability. 
sustainability for sustainability, it would be necessary to develop new and independent mechanisms for monitoring the behavior of the officials, and of course, to enhance the awareness with regard to corruption, not only among the officials, but also among the ordinary population. Thank you. Now it's time for questions and discussion. Your questions or comments. 